All right, we'll uh, get started. Okay, so again, this projector seems to be dead, so uh, everyone will have to look on this side. Okay, uh, let me just do some logistics stuff first. So we have three lectures left. Uh, so there's today, next Friday, and then because last Friday was a holiday, the last lecture will be on the Tuesday that follows, okay? Um, and uh, if you have a Tuesday class, your next, your last Tuesday class will be next week. So next week, if you ha happen to have a class on Tuesday, your last lecture is uh, next week. For all the people that have Monday and, and Friday classes, your last lecture will be the following week. So it's always a little confusing, but anyways, all you need to know is that you, um, it's not like us having our class on Tuesday is going to compete with your other Tuesday class. I happen to have a Tuesday and a Friday class. I know some of you are in both. Um, uh, the final exam then uh, we saw the date uh, from last class I forget already what it is uh, the room number is not posted I have it they used to post it but now for some reason they don't um, I will uh, I'll post it um, sorry this is the wrong class it's this one Uh, there'll be two rooms, so you'll get split. I'll uh, I'll just make a sheet and put it on Moodle or something. Some or usually I just do it alphabetically, uh, and so you'll you'll go to your assigned room. Uh, I'll be available. I'll just walk uh, between the two rooms, and there'll be invigilators uh, in the in both rooms as well. Uh, there was a question during the break. I'll just answer it now. Uh, the uh, sample exam is very old. Uh, the course changed a bunch. In particular, there's certain topics that are covered now in other courses. So anyway, so you can look through it if there's a question that's asking you about SQL injection or return-oriented programming, and you know for a fact we didn't cover it in the class, then just skip it. Um, I, yeah, I would prefer to not give a sample exam at all because I don't want you to like get locked into like that's the questions I'm going to ask. Because you've seen those questions, I'm purposely not going to ask anything like, like even related to that. It's just students every year want to, they want some sort of sample exam. And so eventually I just gave in and, and put, a, put the final exam from the previous year up. But anyways. Uh, yeah, so your assignment two are due today, is that right? And then if you have a slip day, you will hand it on Sunday. Okay, is there uh, questions about anything logistically? Uh, project oh, yeah, okay. Uh, so your project is due when? Uh, 16th of April, which is a Tuesday. Uh, it might say 17th. That could be my mistake. Uh, it just says last class. Uh, yeah, so is there a, a more specific question you want to ask? As you told on Tuesday, asking on Friday to extend the data. Yeah, okay, so does, would anyone want a little more time to work on your projects? Yes. Especially since you have a lot of other deadlines. Um, so what I can do is uh, definitely extend it. Um, so technically we're not allowed to make things due during exam time. So it will still be due the last day of class, but I will accept it without penalty uh, to a, a date. Um, does anyone have an idea of how much of an extension you want? Okay, so the, your exam is on the 26th. Uh, the, I, I won't make it due the same day as the exam because then you might spend all your time on the project. So it's either going to have to be, like, say, two days before the exam, uh, day exam, or it can be like two days after. The problem with the day after is that, again, you can't do a project in a day, which, but I mean, you could wrap it up. What if we did the 29th? So your exam is on Friday the 26th, then you can take Saturday, Sunday, uh, and polish it. You're not starting your project, you're promising me. Um, and then hand it down on the 29th sometime. Maybe, maybe earlier, like around noon or something like that. Uh, I can't get the exams marked anyways, because by the time we write it, the exam office is closed, because some of it will be on multiple choice. So I, I won't be able to 
to even submit them until Monday anyways. Anyways, just know that like if your projects are coming to me on the 29th, you know, you're not going to have your mark on the 30th or, or the 1st, right? It's, and I have another whole class, and so it's going to, but even if you gave me the exam or the projects before the exam, it probably wouldn't save any time anyway. So anyways, I should get the marks to you within maybe a week of the final exam. Um, but, but anyways, don't start spamming me if I, if it's been a little longer than a week. Uh, most, in most cases, it's like a kind of two week uh, thing. Now, there is a complication that just occurred to me that I didn't mention in the other class. I, I need to circle back. Um, some of you are potential graduates, meaning this is your last course ever. Uh, does anyone know that that applies to them? Okay, then it, it maybe doesn't matter. Uh, potential graduates because they need your marks right away so they know whether you would uh, graduate. Um, we need your marks a little bit early. So they, they want them within like three days of your final exam. Um, so I think what I'll do is I will, uh, Anyways, I, I might have two deadlines. So like if you and no one on your team is a potential graduate, uh, then you can submit by the 29th, that's fine. Uh, if you are a potential graduate, I might grab it from you maybe two days before the exam, or I might grab it, even it could maybe be the Monday after the exam, but it might have to be like early in the morning, like at 9 a.m. Just then I can mark it that day and then, uh, and then submit the marks. Um, Yeah, so that's more or less the same as 29th at 9 a.m. Yeah, okay, okay. This is what I'll do. So Sunday deadline's not crazy about weekends, but anyways. Um, if you are a potential graduate or you have someone on your team that's a potential graduate, I'll get it from you 28th evening. So that will be this. You'll write your exam on Friday. You'll have Saturday. You'll have Sunday to, let's say, 8 p.m. Uh, and then uh, if you're not, then I'll grab it from you the next day on the 29th. Okay. Or maybe I should, yeah, well, whatever. 28th, 29th. I, okay, just to keep it simple, I'll make the deadline for everyone the 28th, just one deadline. Uh, if it's the 28th at 8 p.m. and you really need a couple extra hours, just send me an email and you can hand it on the 29th. I'm not. I'm not going to care, but don't go beyond the 29th because I, I really need to start marking. Okay. Uh, let me, I'll just change Moodle right now before I, f I forget even what I said. Um, so I'll say accepted. Okay, that should work. Now, if there's some problem with submitting it, let me know. Okay, other questions about anything logistical or about the last lecture, anything like that? Yeah. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, yeah. So you can be like, the user does this, so far so good, but then they do this, and then now all of a sudden, yeah. And a walkthrough, like the word walkthrough, like it's like you're stepping through it, right? So at every step, it like a, a task is like walking from point A to B, 
And to get from A to B, you have to take a whole bunch of steps. Yeah. So you have the unit of a step. So at every step, you need to consider the guidelines. Tell me how it's going. Uh, and then when you get all the way from point A to point B, then you say, okay, that's that whole core task, that stuff. Does that make sense? Yeah, cool. Other questions? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so we're again going to kind of switch gears uh, completely. Uh, we're going to talk about policies. I'm just going to try and turn it on. lights should go up somehow. All right, whatever. Um, okay, so we'll talk, we're going to talk about uh, policies. So policies are uh, decisions that need to be made. They're, you can think of them kind of like rules or procedures uh, for things. Uh, policies can take different forms. So the, because this is an engineering course, you can imagine we're eventually going to get to technical policies. So policies that software implements rules about things and so next class, we're going to look at a policy that your browser uses as it concerns cookies. So you already know a bit about cookies from your assignment. Uh, we're going to go through all the details of it, and we'll look at, at uh, what's your browser's policy in terms of cookies. Uh, and then the last class, we'll look at the browser policy for something that's closely related, which is when a website weaves together content from multiple websites, uh, how does it sort of isolate them from each other? Or does it? Uh, and in particular, the, the main thing is uh, JavaScript. So if you are pulling JavaScript in from multiple places, you're putting it on the same website, uh, does it all run together? Can, the, can it talk to the other JavaScript? Or, or are they isolated? Are they contained? And as you can imagine, there's different scenarios where sometimes you might want containment, sometimes you might want it to interact uh, with other elements of the page. And so the browser is going to have different ways of, of handling it. Um, and then there's going to be a whole bunch of attacks, like cross-site scripting and, and things like that, that, that are a result of that policy. Okay, so uh, we'll get there uh, next class and the last class. But today's class, just to introduce the idea of policies, I thought uh, we'll look at like more like human policies uh, rather than uh, tech policies, because there's a lot that you can learn from them. So I have one big example, which I'll get to, but before I do, I'll kind of go through the basics of policies. Okay, so we have policies, procedures, processes, they're all kind of the same, uh, they're different words for the same kind of idea. And a lot of security sometimes, or oftentimes it's common that security would come down to policies. So if there's some procedural flaw, then there's a way to break the security of a system that's non-technical, okay? So kind of like social engineering, in social engineering you stepped out of technical attacks, you went through humans. In this case, you're going to step out of technical uh, attacks. You're going to study the rules, and you're going to see, is there a loophole in this rule? Is there some way that I can do what I want to do, uh, even though like, the, plain re the plain reading of the, of the rules would be I shouldn't be allowed to do it, but the rules are only as good as, as they're written up. Okay, um, So, Usually, the kinds of attacks that we see in this category are things like escalation of privilege. Okay, so you, you aren't privileged to do something, somehow you find a loophole and, and you find a way to be uh, privileged. But they, they might take other forms, uh, we'll see. Uh, and we've already seen some examples in class of uh, policy loopholes. We just sort of presented them differently. So for example, we called this social engineering, but if you remember in the social engineering lectures, there was this guy at Matt, 
and he lost all his uh, information. He got his computer wiped out and his phone wiped out. And all of it came down to the fact that uh, if you call up Amazon and say, I'm Matt, I forgot my, my password, they'll say, well, what's your credit card number? And then the attacker will be like, well, I don't know the credit card number. And so that's what keeps an attacker from hijacking your account. But what the attacker realized is that there's a policy flaw or a procedural flaw. If I first call Amazon and say, hi, I'm Matt, I want to add a new credit card to my account, they won't try to authenticate you much deeper than that. They'll just be like, sure, that's great. Right? Then I hang up, I call back and say, I'm mad, I forgot my password. They say, well, what's your credit card number? I just added a credit card number to the account, so I know it. Right? So then I, I tell them what the credit card is, and they say, great, you must be Matt, because no one other than Matt would know that credit card number. And then there's a whole story about how everything went wrong uh, as a result of that. Uh, way back at the start of class, we spent a long time on TLS, HTTPS. Uh, we had how do you figure out that someone actually owns a domain, right? Well, I'm going to send an email to admin at that domain and it's going to have a challenge or a link and they're going to click on it. If they click on it, then I'll believe that they own that domain. That's a procedure or it's a policy. I decided it. I decided to send it to admin at domain.com as opposed to something out else. These are all procedural issues, okay? Uh, and so when one CA implemented a different policy that said, I'll send it to SSL certificates at domain.com, then that was a loophole and an attacker was able to exploit that by going to Gmail or uh, Hotmail, live, live, Microsoft Live Mail, and registering SSL certificates at Live Mail, then getting a, a CA certificate for all of Microsoft as a result, or at least all of Live. Um, so that, that was uh, basically a flaw in procedure. Okay, so that's the kind of thing that we're going to be talking about is uh, these policies and procedures. You don't tend to think about them because they're not really technical. Um, sometimes you implement them in code, but before you code it up, you have to figure out what's the policy that you're trying to reflect. Uh, and so it, it ends up being um, a form of attack, and sometimes it can be a subcomponent of other types of attacks. So it could be one piece of a bigger attack, like you're doing social engineering, and there's this policy flaw that gets you there. And then once you, you're a certain way through the attack, then it becomes a purely technical attack where you're, you're doing, you know, using malware or using zero day exploits or whatever the case is. Okay, so policies don't have to be a, a whole attack in and of themselves. Is there any difference between policies, procedures, and procedures? For this class, no. So we'll just consider them to all be the same thing. So I might use different terms indistinguishably. Now, this class is also about methodology. And so what I like to do is I like to pull in examples, both where we have a methodology, like usability, it's like, okay, you do a cognitive walkthrough, there's a very clear methodology. But I also like to show you things where there aren't clear methodologies. And it helps you understand the kind of boundaries of methodologies. Like methodologies don't always work or they're hard to write down or that type of thing. So social engineering also didn't have good methodologies. Okay, this is very similar, it's not quite the same. Uh, at the end, I will give you some methodologies you can use. So uh, it's not that there, there are actually zero methodologies, uh, but there's not a lot of great uh, kind of methodologies. So there's no cognitive walkthrough of policies where you can just follow this method. It's been studied for 20 years. Uh, there's 100 academic papers that have applied this and it works perfectly uh, on, on policies. Okay, so I'll give you some quick, other quick examples that we haven't talked about just to sort of give you the idea of, of, of policies. Uh, then we'll spend a lot of time on airport security. So that will be the example I'll use uh, as, as a policy that's sort of at the human level. And then the next two classes, we'll look at technical policies. Both are browser-based policies, one with cookies, one with basically, it's called the same origin policy, but it, it has to do with JavaScript and, and how what permissions it has to run uh, when, when it's running in a website. Okay, so here's some other examples you may have seen uh, before or read about in the news. Um, so sometimes we talk about password policies. Uh, so a password policy is like you have to have a capital letter, you have to have 12 characters at least, you have to have digits, that type of thing. That's a policy. The website doesn't have to use it. Some do, some don't. 
Some have different policies than others. Um, those types of policies tend to not really elicit better passwords. Uh, that's what the usability literature shows. Um, but an, another type of password policy that, that actually is pretty sensible is uh, websites can go around and look at all the passwords that have leaked. Uh, and so Apple, for example, does this. And so when I use Apple's password manager and I have some password that I created 10 years ago and it shows up in a leak, Apple starts sending me notifications saying, you know, you better change this password because we've seen it in a leak. Um, so a website could also have that list and it could just do a quick check when you type in your password. Does this match anything on the list of, of passwords that have been leaked? And if it does, then we'll just say, no, you can't use that password, okay? So it stops you from reusing a password that you've used on another website, on the new website uh, um, that, that has been broken, the, the other website having been broken. <coughs> uh, most websites have some sort of privacy policy. This is a legal policy. So you read a privacy policy, it's like a legal document, and it says what they'll do with, with your data, what, how they'll track you, what cookies they'll use, that type of thing. Um, another thing uh, that, that was sort of a policy decision is uh, Facebook decided that they were going to use two-factor authentication uh, to log in. Okay, so you would give them a phone number, you try and log in, they send a text message with the number, uh, and, and then they're going to log you into the website. Okay, and so this is a, this is a policy decision. Right, they're just trying to strengthen their authentication. Um, but policy decisions sometimes have other consequences. So when Facebook rolled this out, people were actually pretty skeptical right away. And they said, uh, maybe you don't actually care about security. I bet what you want is you just want everyone's phone number. And you know that it's a real phone number because they're, they're, they're using it. You know it's active. You don't know it's their phone number from five years ago. Uh, because every time they log in, they have to access uh, the text messages from this phone. So you're pretty sure uh, that this, this, these phone numbers are real. And then maybe you could turn around and sell it to a third party and, uh, you know, for advertising, and now all of a sudden you get like text messages with advertisements or, or that type of thing. Okay? So uh, policies aren't always done with the best interests of users in mind. Uh, another policy that was in the news was sort of controversial uh, was Apple proposed this. I forget if, if it actually is now in your phone or if it was just a proposal and then it kind of died off. Um, but anyway, the, the idea would be that every time you take a picture uh, with your iPhone, uh, there's an AI engine that's in your phone and it's going to try and figure out if it's some sort of illicit image. If it's an illicit image, then it's going to do something about it. And so the original proposal that was that it would actually notify law enforcement if it saw certain types of images, okay? So the main thing would be like exploitative, sexually exploitative image of children, okay? So like a nude picture of, of a child would, uh, so you're using AI, so it's not perfect, right? But the AI is trying to match it and then it's phoning home. Then there were these news articles of like, for example, a parent and they had a kid and their kid had a rash and they were texting the doctor a picture of the rash to figure out if it was serious or not. And then all of a sudden, the police are showing up at the door, accusing them of, of you know, sending child pornography. Um, so anyway, so I'm not saying it's good or bad. That's not my position. Uh, but these policies have, policy decisions have ramifications, okay? So you have to take some care uh, when you cho choose these policies. Uh, you have to think about false positives and false negatives. Okay, so a false positive would be something that, that shouldn't have been caught getting caught, and then false negatives, like something that should have been caught not getting caught. Uh, you have to think through the consequences of both of them. Usually AI models, you can kind of, you know, turn up false positives at the expense, or turn down false positives at the expense of false negatives or vice versa. Um, another thing is, uh, I actually forget what this is. I wrote this, I made these slides last year, URL address manipulation. Okay, well, I won't ask that on an exam. Oh, I have an example. Okay, good. Let me uh, remind myself. 
Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember what this is. I just didn't recognize it from the description. Uh, so this is something else that, that, that happened in real life. Um, so there was a, a, a website, I think it was for AT&T, which is a big uh, telecom in the US. And what they would do is they would send you a bill uh, in the email. You could click on it. There would be a link. And then it would show you the bill. And the address looked like this address here. OK? So what's your profile number if you look at this address? OK. What if I change 741 to 740? OK. So there's no authentication that we can see on this URL. Maybe it needs to see that I'm logged in with cookies or something like that. But in this case, the way that the, the, the website was programmed was if you put 740 in, uh, then it would show you customer 740's bill, right? And it would also show their address and their name and things like that. So someone wrote a script, uh, and they just downloaded profile one, profile two, profile three, until they ran out of profiles. Uh, AT&T saw it. Uh, they saw it in the network logs that someone had downloaded this. Uh, so they turned it over to law enforcement. Law enforcement got a warrant. Uh, and then they charged this person with hacking, and said it was hacking. And he said, well, this is, they're just URLs. They're public, right? And there was actually a court case. And I think that the decision, as I remember, is that he actually, it actually was upheld. Uh, because he scripted it. Uh, to ask for it. The scripting part was considered hacking. But then there were lots of people that thought it was like a terrible like decision. And so it was a very controversial case. But anyway, so that that was um, uh, something that, that, that actually resulted uh, in an action. Um, so websites, they chose this policy of, of or this procedure for showing people the, the bills. Uh, no authentication other than a unique identifier. Uh, and there's still websites that I've seen accidentally where I've tried to get stuff from it and, and notice that this is still a problem on, on some websites. Uh, another thing is uh, cloud hosting. Um, so you, uh, let's say you use a virtual machine. Uh, so you have some stuff that, computations that you want run, uh, say on Amazon Web Services or whatever. Uh, what will happen is you'll, put your computation, you'll give it to them, they'll allocate you some server space, uh, they're going to run it, and that's going to run on a physical machine, okay? So there is a physical machine in Amazon's possession in a warehouse maybe in the West Island of Montreal, and it's actually running your process. At the same time, on the same physical machine, there's going to be other people who are asking for computation, okay? So your process is going to get co-located with other people's processes. Now, there are certain things that you can ask the operating system that can let you infer what other processes are doing on the same machine as yours, OK? And so the degree to which this is allowed or disallowed, how tightly you contain these processes as they're running, that's a set of procedures that Apple had to go through. And in some cases, they had to invent technologies to isolate, maybe through hardware, uh, different uh, processes uh, from, from uh, running, okay? Um, and so anyway, so this is a set of procedures that you have to sit down, you have to figure out what it looks like. And for a long time, there were a lot of attacks uh, where you could get co-located with a sensitive computation that was being done and you could infer information about it. My understanding is now it's pretty good, it's pretty secure, um, the, the way that they put everything in containers. Another thing is uh, swatting. So this is something that shows up in the news. Um, uh, so basically, it's an attack where if I know your physical address and I don't like you for whatever reason, I'll call the police. I'll pretend that there's some crime that's happening in that location that's urgent uh, and very violent. And then the police will show up. And instead of just knocking on the door and, and asking about it, I'll escalate it to the point where they'll come like in full SWAT gear, so SWAT in this case means like the, the tactical gear uh, that police bring. They're going to knock down the door. They're going to go in with their guns drawn. And they're going to like very quickly you know, try and neutralize any, any violence that's happening. Of course, the person there isn't doing anything. Okay. Now, what are the chances that, say, there's an accidental gunfire and someone gets shot? Uh, if not, it still scares you know, the person that's, that's in the, you know, having police break into your house with guns drawn. You know, so, 
Uh, anyways, so this is an attack. People do it. Now, this is a policy. So the police are like, well, we got a call and we couldn't, we can't tell whether it's SWAT or not. It might be a real crime, right? So if we don't go in and it ends up being a real crime, then it's going to look bad on us, right? But if, it, if it's not a real crime and we go in with the SWAT team, uh, then it looks bad on us. So we're sort of stuck. We have to have a policy. Either, either we're going in with the SWAT team or we're not, right? Uh, and so they, they have a policy. They're going to play it safe. They're going to go in with the SWAT team uh, because they care more about uh, false negatives than false positives, all right? Then once someone commits to a policy, then you can abuse it. Right? So people abuse the fact uh, that there's this policy by swatting other people. And, and it started kind of like as a joke. There's a whole like documentary on it on Netflix. And like the early swatting, it was just sort of like gamers who were mad at each other. Uh, and, and they were doing it kind of like a prank. But now it's gotten like pretty serious uh, over time. It's also a big waste of money. It's a waste of the police time and, and, and all of that type of stuff on top of, of the actual victims. Uh, another thing is uh, Apple's AirTags, they came out. Uh, and so AirTags, I don't know if you know them, they're like a little thing that looks like a coin and it's going to track the location of whatever you put it on. So you might put it in a bag, uh, in your luggage, when you fly somewhere, uh, in your wallet, on your keys, uh, that type of thing. So I have one somewhere in my knapsack. See if I can pull it out quick. Okay, I don't know where it is. It's somewhere in here. Uh, anyways, it's just like a little, looks like a coin. Uh, now the problem with this, it's not a GPS tracker. So you could have a GPS tracker. A GPS tracker would have its location. Um, it could figure out where it is. So that's half of your problem. Where, where actually is the tag? The other half is it's only useful if my bag is somewhere else, if I can have a map with a pinpoint on it. But that requires that device to connect to the internet and relay its location to a server that's going to collect it for you, OK? Now, if you have a GPS, you need batteries and all that type of stuff. So these devices tend to be big. Not like huge, but a GPS tracker would be like a sizable uh, kind of device. And it would have to have some sort of Wi-Fi or internet connectivity. But it, is it going to work in all countries? I don't know. Who knows, OK? Maybe it uses 3G or 5G or something like that. Uh, maybe the company that sells it to you has like coverage, cell phone coverage all over the world. So maybe you could get away with that kind of technology. But anyways, most people didn't use GPS trackers because they were just, it was too complicated uh, to use. Then what Apple said is, hey, we have all these people in the world, they're all walking around with iPhones. The iPhone has a GPS in it. It knows where it is. And it has an internet connection. Okay. So what if we had a simple Bluetooth tracker and the Bluetooth tracker, there was an earlier technology that also worked like this called Tile. So I would have my phone, I would have my Tile, but my phone had to talk to the Tile, okay? So if my Tile is, is in um, Miami, we lost luggage in Miami recently, if my Tile's in Miami and my phone is in Montreal, they're not talking to each other, okay? So the idea of Apple was we're going to give you the tracker and because we control the iOS operating system, we're going to turn everyone's phone in the whole world into a reader for your device. So as long as your device comes within 25 meters, whatever Bluetooth can do, uh, within any iPhone, that iPhone will pick up the signal. It will check its own GPS location. It's going to assume that the tiles be, or the, the devices, the tracker is beside the phone because it's within Bluetooth distance of it and it's going to report to the cloud where it is, then you can log in and you can check it. The person with the phone doesn't know it's your tile. Apple hides all of that information. It just kind of relays it around, okay? And so these became super useful. A, they're small because they're just Bluetooth. You have a battery. The battery lasts a year. You don't have to charge it or something like that. Um, they're relatively cheap. Uh, they're about maybe $25. A four-pack is 
less than $100. I, I think it's about $80 for four of them. Mm -hmm. um, so they're relatively cheap. And you have phones everywhere. And so they work, uh, they, they, they work well, OK? Now, the problem, is there any problems with this? OK, well, one thing is you can track people, right? So I want to follow you home. I want to know where you live. I put one in your bag when you're not looking. I put one in your car. You know, I put it under the, the, the dashboard or whatever. Now, this was all possible with GPSs anyways, OK? So you could always do a GPS tracking. Police use it, right? They, they had magnets on them. They put it in your car somewhere so they can trace your car. Um, but anyways, what Apple did is they democratized it. They made it super cheap. Lots of people have them. You buy a four pack, you put two in your suitcase, and you have two left over. You don't know what to do with them, right? And so they're all floating around. Um, and so anyway, so when Apple came out with this, people were like, this is, I mean, it's kind of cool. But at the same time, like the, the cons of, of, of uh, surveilling people and tracing them, uh, stalking them outweigh the benefits. Um, so then Apple's implemented a policy change, okay? And it's, uh, you can decide whether you think it's an acceptable compromise or not. But what they said is, if I see your phone going somewhere, I assume you're going with your phone. And if I see somebody else's AirTag, and it's everywhere your phone goes, this other AirTag goes, then I'm going to tell you, oh, by the way, uh, there's this AirTag that's like following you around, basically. So the, I think I have a picture of what the warning looks like. So it says, AirTag found moving with you. The location of this AirTag can be seen by the owner. Uh, your current location can be seen by the owner of this AirTag. It was first seen with you at 6.20 AM. Um, so anyway, so this is their sort of, so they implemented this policy. It didn't come with this. It wasn't until like activists pushed back on it, then a Apple decided, OK, we, we need to do something about it. And so this was the solution that they came up with. Uh, this is a good paper. I think it's on Moodle that has a bunch of other kinds of policies. Um, SIM swapping is one thing that they spend a lot of time on. So SIM swapping is uh, basically your cell phone number. It's sort of complicated. So I have a cell phone number, and I have a phone, right? How does, how does that number get assigned to this physical device? Like, so you call that number, so that goes to Bell. And Bell says, I own that number. I know whose that is. But this device is going to ring, right? So how does Bell make this device ring when someone calls that phone number? OK, OK. So the, the, the number is in this SIM card, basically. So there's a physical device. Sometimes now they're virtual or whatever. It's programmable. But it's a piece of hardware that's in this phone. Uh, and they used to have trays where you could take it out. It's just like a little card. And it has this device number in it. OK? Uh, and then Apple, or sorry, Bell has a database that says this phone number is assigned to this SIM number. OK? So uh, you call the phone number, it goes to Bell. Bell looks up in their database what's the SIM card for this phone. And then they ring that SIM card, which rings this physical device. It, the card's in the thing, and then my phone rings. OK? So, Let's say I want to change phone numbers, but I don't want to change phones. Can I do it? I can. I just switch out the SIM card. OK? Uh, conversely, let's say I want to keep the same phone number, but I have a brand new phone. Can I do that? Can I have the, the same phone number ring a different phone than this one if I lose this phone? And so the answer is yes. I'll put a new SIM number in that new phone, and then they'll update their database with the new SIM card. OK? Now, the problem with that is if you can call Bell, you can get someone else's phone number to ring your phone by just convincing Bell that you lost your phone, and this is your new phone, and this is your new, new SIM card. OK? So that's called SIM swapping. Now, why do I want your phone number? Well, maybe I want to get your phone calls. Yeah, so that, that could be something. But the more important thing is we now use two-factor authentication for lots of things. OK? So that's what I want. I have your password because I got it through a password breach. But when I tried to break into your account, I couldn't do it because I needed, I didn't have the, the second factor. So now I do SIM swapping. I get your phone number. I get the second factor. Now I go in and drain your, your Bitcoin account of all of its Bitcoins, which is exactly what happens with this kind of thing. How does the phone company figure out whether you 
are the real person who lost their phone or you're an attacker trying to get that SIM card swap to their phone? Okay, okay. You can have a pin, you could have security questions. Both of those are, uh, you, if you remember in social engineering, there was a video and they actually did the SIM swapping through social engineering. So there was both a pin and there was uh, personal details. And the umbrella term for that is a policy, right? So th th those are both examples of policies, okay? So they have some policy for figuring out what it is. Does every phone company implement the same policy? No, no. why, why not? So there's no law that says you have to do it this way. They make it up. Some, somebody here has an idea and, and someone else doesn't have the same idea, okay? So every company will have different policies. Is there any bad policies out there? You bet, okay? There's people who didn't think through their policies and procedures and they implemented some pretty dumb ideas. These people went, they called 50 different cell phone companies to do a SIM swapping attack on themselves uh, and they succeeded in 39 of the 50 cases. So an example of a bad policy, there's lots in the, in, in the call, is they, you would call them up and you'd say, okay, I, I lost my phone, I need to switch my SIM, SIM card. And they'd say, okay, no problem. Tell me the last three phone calls you received at that number. If you can tell me those last three phone numbers, then I'll believe it's actually you. Okay? Now, I've already told you this is a bad policy. Why is that a bad policy? Okay, so the attacker calls that number three times. Then he calls Bell and says, I lost my phone, I need to swip, swap them. And they're like, well, what are the last three calls? They know the last three calls because they're the ones that made those three calls. Okay, so that's almost the same as that at Matt example where you add a credit card number. Now you know a credit card because you added it, right? So anyway, so the, you can read the paper for other examples. Um, and you can also think then about, is there a general policy rule, right? So at Matt and this, they both have the same kind of thing, which is I'm making an authentication decision based on some information. I'm assuming that only the real person owns, knows this information, but this information is actually what we would say adversarially controlled. So the adversary can control it. So like the credit card number that you have on Amazon could be adversarially controlled if an adversary is allowed to add credit card numbers to your account. Uh, the phone numbers that last called your phone number, that's adversarially controlled because the adversary can be the person to call that, that phone number, okay? So in general, you wouldn't want to base any information on anything that an adversary could, could control, right? So that would be like a general rule when you're writing policies uh, to, to look for. And then uh, th they also talk a bit about like, um, sometimes you, like say I just leave Bell. I'm like, I'm forget this, I'm going to Videotron, I'm going to Rogers, it's cheaper. Uh, then I have my SIM card so they cancel it, right? Maybe I take my phone number with me, whatever. Uh, but eventually that SIM card's going to get re-handed out to someone else, okay? And when it gets re-handed out, it's possible that old stuff, I guess it wouldn't work if I take my number, but if I leave my number with Bell, all the old accounts that I have are maybe still sending two-factor authentication requests to that number, which is being recycled into this SIM, and then uh, someone else is getting uh, those requests as well. So that's another kind of policy that you have to think through. Okay, and then here's some just news headlines about people losing lots of money because of SIM swapping. Okay, here's another fun one. Okay, so the headline, I, I read this article, it's called The Life Up Ending Flaw That USPS Won't Fix. USPS is the United States Postal Service. Uh, so they, they're the ones that deliver your mail, the Canada Post equivalent. Now, every now and then you, you uh, move, right? And when you move, you want to have your mail that's sent from your old address forwarded to your new address, okay? Because you can't always notify all the companies, all right? So USPS had a policy about when are we going to let people forward their mail, okay? I could, I could put your name in and say I want your mail to come to me, 
right? And so obviously that no one wants that to happen, okay? So they have to have some policy to make sure that the only people that are, are getting their mail forwarded are the real people, okay? So this is the policy that they implement. First off, you can request it without showing any ID. So you can just go in and request it. It doesn't mean that they'll necessarily forward it. It's just the start of the process. But you can submit a form that just says, this is the old address, this is the new address. I want this forwarded. Then what they'll do is they'll mail two postcards, letters, that type of thing, to the two addresses that are on the form, the old address and the new address. And they'll say, um, uh, they'll basically say, somebody's asking to forward this information, or forward your mail from this address to this address, okay? Uh, if you have a problem with that, let us know and we'll cancel it, okay? Now, one of two things will happen. One of the two people at, at either of those addresses, like say I'm trying to get your mail, I'm going to get one of the postcards because I'm sending it to my new address. So I'm going to be like, that's fine, that's what I want, so I'm not going to answer. And, but you get that postcard and you're like, I don't know who this person is that's trying to forward their, email, or their mail to this address, I'm going to phone them and cancel it, okay? Now, is there any problem with, with this type of policy that you can see? Yeah. Okay. So if they get the mail from the address, then what are they going to do with it? Okay. Okay. So it's even worse. Um, like, so, so you're right. So the, the attack is always like, if I can get the, the mail from the other address, then I can, I can go through with this. Okay. But in this case, <coughs> the policy is basically, if we don't hear anything from anyone, we assume it's okay. So your goal as the attacker is actually just to stop the other person from getting the mail, right? Or you could even just try it and hope that they're not looking at their mail that closely or they look at it and they're like, oh, that's weird, but they throw it out or they're like, yeah, I need to do that like tomorrow and then they never get around to it, okay? So you could just try it and, and just hope that maybe it gets lost in the mail. Maybe they don't fill it out anyways. Maybe they, they wait too long to fill it out. Or you could try to stop them from receiving the mail, or you could actually capture that piece of mail, okay? Um, so this policy is a general policy. We've already talked about this before. Um, the difference between deny override and allow override. So allow override says, if you don't hear anything, then you just assume everything's good, okay? Deny override would be like, if you don't hear anything, you assume things are bad. You assume things are, are bad until you hear that they're good and allow override is you assume they're good until you hear that they're bad, okay? So here they implemented allow override, which means if nobody answers these mails, then the change goes through. And so where have we seen this before? Well, one example is, remember we talked about revocation. You ask the server, hey, is this server, is this, cert this SSL certificate revoked? If you don't hear anything back, you assume it's okay, right? Um, and so in the same case, the adversary can just drop uh, if they can drop that postcard from, from being reached, then they, they, get, they get all the mail forwarded. Uh, or you can just hope that it gets lost. So uh, a quote from the article I really like is this one. It says, in a, particular, a particularly comical case from 2017, an Atlanta resident was arrested for cashing checks that he had rerouted from the corporate headquarters of UPS. So a company that's in the mailing industry, he basically filled out the form and said, I want all of UPS's mail to come to me, okay? Now, uh, USPS, no, different company or government, they sent the postcard to UPS. What happens if you send a, a, a postcard to the corporate headquarters of UPS? What are the chances that someone's actually gonna look at that postcard, figure out what's happening, make that phone call to stop it from happening? Right? The chances of that like postcard just getting lost is like very highly likely, okay? So we don't know what happened, but basically no one complained at UPS. And so USPS said, great, we'll put the mail forwarding. So then this guy started getting all the emails, or sorry, all the mail, and there were some like payroll checks and things like that, and they started catch, cashing them, and that's how he got caught. Um, but anyways, it goes on and it says that, uh, it resulted in literal bathtubs of mail piling up outside 
the hapless fraudster's apartment. So he had like, there was so much mail because it's corporate mail, right? He couldn't even like keep it all in his apartment. So he had like huge piles of mail that were like outside of his apartment. And uh, UPS didn't notice it for three months. Three months later, they're like, oh, it's weird. We haven't got a single letter in the, like, the last three months. Uh, or maybe they noticed it, but they took them three months to figure it out or whatever. And so eventually they figured it out. They went back. They found this other person's address. The police showed up there. They had mountains and mountains of mail. Uh, and so, yeah, anyways. So this is a policy loophole. Uh, and the deny override is, is kind of what you could do instead to fix this. Um, actually, there's two things. So one thing is, as soon as you submit the form, you could do an ID check. Like, is the old address match the identifier of this person? That would, that would stop a lot of this. And the other thing you could do is a deny override, which says that um, the person has to get the postcard, then they actually have to opt into it. So they have to get the postcard, they have to actually phone in and say, yes, I do want this change, then you actually implement the change, okay? Now, this doesn't stop the attack where the adversary can still try and get that postcard before it reaches you. They can walk by your house, they can see the mail person come and leave, they can go to your mailbox and try and pull that card out so that you never get it, and then they can, they can type the information in. So deny override doesn't, it's not completely secure, but it's certainly cert way better than, than allow override. <coughs> okay. So now we'll switch gears and we'll talk a little bit about airport security. Um, so this will be kind of like a longer example and we'll, we'll try and go through all the different steps uh, that are involved in airport security. So how many steps roughly are there in airport security? Four. When I say airport security, what do you think of? Okay, that's the, a good student answer. So uh, yeah, so, so that's what we want to consider. We want to consider everything from when we go into the airport to when we're sitting on the plane. Maybe even before and after those two points. Uh, if you talk to people about security though, they usually think about you know when you go through the metal detectors and you have to take your shoes off and put your bags through and things like that. So that's, we, we call that like going through security, right? Um, so that's one piece of it. It's one step. It's a, a core step. But there are, it's more like five, six, seven steps uh, that are involved in the whole process. And that's one of them, but it's not all of them. All right. Now I'm going to assume everyone in the room has flown before, probably internationally at least once. Um, okay. So what's the very first step? I actually, I accidentally showed it to you. If you didn't see it, what's, what, when does this whole security thing start? Does it actually start when you show up at the airport? No. Okay, it starts before. When does it start? Okay, so when you buy the ticket itself, that's basically what kicks it off. Okay. Um, all right, so I buy an airplane ticket. Uh, what do I have to tell the airline uh, in order to buy a ticket? Can I buy it anonymously? No. Okay, so I have to tell it my name. My ID, maybe my passport number, email address, all that stuff. Um, okay, so let's say I buy a ticket and I get sick, so I can't fly. But good news, you want to go to to Boston, so I'll just give it to you, and you can fly instead, right? Yeah. But a concert ticket's like that, right? You all know that. Okay, so why why can't I do that? Okay, so it is tied to your ID, and therefore it won't match. Uh, I guess the, the question is, well, what, what, why is it? Like, who cares? Like, the airline doesn't care. There's an empty seat. If I'm not sitting in the seat, why do they care whether it's me or someone else that's sitting in the seat? So that's a different concern. So that, that, would, uh, that would be more like I show up with my, a ticket that's in my name and I impersonate. But what's the problem with me giving you my ticket and you flying? No one's, you're really you and I'm really me. There's no impersonation. Because I didn't buy the That's true. You didn't buy it. So That's fine. Who is with them. But they're saying that. The government. Okay, okay. So the, the answer is that the airlines aren't the only interested party here. Okay? So the airline are going to share this information with someone else. And that person 
uh, basically, they can't do things instantly. So even though I could give the ticket to you in some sense, then that whole process would have to start again, and there's just not enough time for that to happen, okay? Okay, so tickets are linked to your identity. You can't transfer them to someone else. Um, I know sometimes websites ask for your passport. It's not strictly necessary. So if they're asking for it, it's to save time later, but you can book a ticket without giving your passport, at least at the, at the start. But you do give your name, and if eventually you can't show up with the right passport that matches your name, then you're gonna have trouble later on uh, down the line. Okay, and all of this is, I should say, is subject to change. So this may not be true today. It might be something that was true five years ago. And it's also subject to the airline that you're dealing with, the country that you're flying in, all these rules change. So this is, would be like kind of generally true of something like flying in Canada with Air Canada, but anyways. Okay, so let's say I buy a ticket from Expedia. So I tell Expedia my name. Does Air Canada know my name? And so, no could be an answer, so I just I deal with Expedia itself, but I'm flying with Air Canada. But eventually I'm going to have to show up at the airport and Air Canada is going to have to know who I am, right? So Expedia will have to share that information eventually with Air Canada. Do you think they're going to do that when I buy the ticket or do you think they're going to wait until I fly or I show up and I'm like, I bought this on Expedia and, and then they, they say, oh, now I know who you are. Okay, so the way it works is when you buy the ticket, okay? So basically, uh, I give my money to Expedia, I tell Expedia who I am. Expedia doesn't actually give me the ticket right away, in a sense. It will give me a receipt, it will say, okay, you purchased this, but we're confirming it with the airline. Then a few minutes later, five minutes later, maybe an hour later, it's like, okay, now it's confirmed. Okay, so that's what's happening in the background is that they're going over to Air Canada saying, okay, this person wants to fly and then Air Canada is sending a confirmation to Expedia, Expedia is sending it to me. Now you can also buy your ticket directly from Air Canada. Uh, this is just what happens if you use a third party. Now what Air Canada is going to do in the background is they're going to pass your ID to the government. Okay, and your government, so say the government of Canada, uh, they maintain what's called the no-fly list. So the no-fly list is a list of names and it's people who are not allowed to fly, okay? Uh, at this point, you've actually been issued your ticket, okay? So you have a ticket, it says confirmed. The, the delay between Expedia and, and Air Canada confirming your ticket is not this government check, okay? This government check is something that, that might take days or, or whatever. Um, and so it, it's happening sort of in parallel with you getting ready to go to your trip. If it sh turns out that you are on the no-fly list, you're not going to get on the plane. Okay, They're, you're going to find out sooner rather than later, but you're not going to find out quite yet. We'll get to that later. Okay, so this is why they collect your identity is because they, they're actually checking it. Uh, and this is why you can't transfer your ticket to another name. If you transfer it to another name, you'd have to do this whole check again, okay? You can, in a sense, cancel your ticket and then someone else can rebook a ticket and that ends up being the same thing. But it's why you can't just give your ticket to someone else and then they just fly. Now, there are stories about like, what if you give it to someone that has the same name as you, right? And so my, my understanding is that actually is possible because the no-fly list is name-based. If your name's not on the list, then everyone else that has the same name as you is also not on the list. And if they don't do a passport check uh, when you buy the ticket, the, the airline doesn't actually know that it's this Jeremy Clark as opposed to some other Jeremy Clark, right? Um, so my understanding, but but I think like, now more so airlines are starting to collect passport information and things like that. And so they might say, well, your passport doesn't match. Okay. And so the government will make a decision and uh, eventually you'll hear about it. Um, but we'll, we'll put a pin in that uh, for now. We'll come back to this. Now, another thing about your ticket that you may or may not know uh, is that your uh, Ticket always has this like confirmation code on it. You may have used it because you need to enter it to a website or you're checking in online or something like that or your ticket's not showing up in your app and you have this confirmation code, okay? So it's usually, in Canada, it's usually six characters, I think three letters and three numbers, 
okay? Um, and so this is called a PNR, passenger name record. And a booking code is, is another term for it. And what you don't realize is that if I know just your last name and I know your PNR, I can do a lot with just that piece of information. I can go to basically the airline's website. I can log in as you. That's all it's going to ask me. It's going to show me, it's going to think that I'm you. So it's going to show me everything about your account. So I'll, I'll get your full name, I'll get your uh, address, whatever account details you have. Then I'm able to, to make modifications to your flight if I want to. So I could cancel your flight. I could say, oh, you have a loyalty card. I'm going to replace your loyalty card with my loyalty card so that when you fly, I'm going to get the points. Um, you know, I could, yeah, I could maybe cancel the flight and get some money or some credit for it, uh, that type of thing. Um, so anyways, this, this PNR thing is, is basically kind of like a password for someone being able to log into the airline and change your flight, okay? Do you think this is, do you treat this like a password? No. How would you treat a password? Yeah, would you print your password on a piece of paper and then when you're walking around the airport just sort of like casually have it in your hand? Okay, but that's what people do, right? Like you have your boarding pass, you know someone wants to scan your boarding pass, you have it in your hand. Anyone that's in line beside you could just take a picture of you, not even like just in your general direction, zoom in, they could get that code. Your last name's probably on the ticket as well, right? What about your luggage? You're wheeling your luggage behind you. You usually have a ticket on your luggage. The ticket's going to have that, comp that code on it as well. I mean, the code is everywhere, right? Uh, it's basically how they track all of your stuff. So getting that code is, is not particularly difficult. And once you get it, then there's, there's a lot an attacker could do. And usually it's through like just a website. So it's not like they have to go and pretend to be you and, and that type of thing. It's just like they just do it from their phone and they can make all sorts of changes. Now, a lot of these changes would be just about griefing you, like making your life difficult to no benefit to themselves. Some of them, they might be able to get money somehow or get points or something like that. And they can also just get your personal information, right? If I see you and want to know where you live and what your name is, I just, you know, it's one, one photo click away or, or just shoulder, shoulder surfing and, uh, and getting that, that number. Okay, so your PNR is, is actually like a password. You should treat it like that. So think about that going forward. Uh, but yeah, it's all your emails have it. So anyone that has access to your email, like Concordia IT or whatever, would have your email. It's printed on all your boarding passes. It's printed on luggage tags. Um, oh yeah, and the other thing too is, let's say I can only get part of it, or let's say I just know your last name and I, I see you at the airport and I see you waiting at the gate, right? So I, I, I don't know your, your boarding pass is in your knapsack, so I don't know it. Uh, but somehow I know who you are because I've, I've seen you before, I'm stalking you, I don't know, whatever, I have an air tag on you. Uh, but I see you at the gate, so I know your flight number. So I, I know your airline, I know what flight you're on, and everyone's going to have a different code, but there's not like a thousand people on a flight. There's, there's maybe a hundred. Could I just brute force it? Yes. And so the answer is yes. There's enough structure in that. Like it's not a random code. Uh, a lot of the stuff is, is like there because of information that's observable. And then there'll be a certain aspect of it that's random or it's assigned sequentially uh, that, that you can do. So uh, even if you keep it as a password, you're, it's still not necessarily safe. Okay, we bought our ticket. Now what? Okay, so we show, show up to the airport, and uh, what do we what do we do first when we are at the airport? Okay, who do we show it to? Uh, usually, there's something you do before that. The airline. Okay. 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 So usually, you show up. You. Uh, you check in with the airline, yeah? Okay, so what's the inputs and outputs of the check-in procedure? So what do you have to show and what do you get after checking in? So what do you need to show? Okay, you don't have a ticket though. I just, I bought it on Expedia. 
OK, OK. So somehow I have to identify who I am. And so a passport is usually the, 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 the main thing that you would use. If you go to a counter and talk to a person, they'll just ask for your passport. If you're flying domestically, I'm flying to Toronto, do I need a passport? No, I just need a driver's license or something like that. But they'll usually ask for an ID. Uh, do I have to talk to a human? No. What else? Who else could I talk to? OK, so there's like these computer kiosks. I could talk to one of those. So there I might scan my password. I could even just put in this code, usually. So I could type in this code, and then it will pull up my information. And then that's usually good. The output is my boarding pass. OK, so that's the piece of paper that has like my gate and my seat and all that type of stuff. And uh, maybe some tags that I have to put on my luggage if I'm checking luggage. OK, so that's the main thing. So somehow I say who I am, but I don't strictly have to show a passport. OK, and then uh, the result is I get a boarding pass, I get some luggage tickets, uh, that type of thing. OK, I can do it with a human. If I don't want a human, I can do it with a computer. If I don't want to do it with a computer, I can actually do it with my phone. I can do it in the cab on the way to the airport. I can have the boarding pass as a QR code on my phone. I don't have to ever show my passport to anyone. I don't have to, I don't have to do anything. I just go straight basically to the security line. OK? All right, so we check in at the airport. We might use a kiosk like this. Uh, the main thing is to get your boarding pass and your luggage tags. Uh, if you go to the counter with the human, they'll probably check your ID. If you go to a kiosk, uh, those, they'll do an ID check in the sense of there's a difference between I look at your passport, I look at your picture, and then I look at your face to make sure your face is the face that's on the passport. Okay, I can scan a passport, but it doesn't check my face. That's not really an ID check kind of thing. Okay, so that's more about just like finding the database entry that that. Is belongs to my passport that's uniquely identified to me, OK? So usually the kiosks aren't doing the, the, the face scan. Sometimes they do. Sometimes they have a camera. Uh, there's, there's different airlines and different things do. There's different procedures. But uh, generally, you would just try and call up your database record. That's it. And if you're doing it from your phone, then you're not showing your passport to your phone, usually, right? Sometimes they make you type it in or something like that, but, but you can often fly with just logging in on your phone. Okay. Now, going back to that no-fly list, when I bought the ticket, let's say I was on the no-fly list, this is when I find out about it. Okay. So I'm, I'm, on the, I'm taking an Uber to the airport, I'm on my phone, and I'm like, give me my boarding pass, and my phone will say, um, there's a technical issue with your boarding pass, you need to see a human when you get to the airport. Then I'll go to the airport, and then I'll go to the human, and then they'll say, well, sorry, you're on the no-fly list. And depending on, on how serious it is, there might be police waiting there or something like that. Okay, So that's, that's when you'll find out about that information. Um, so uh, the, the ID check will have happened sometime in the ensuing days uh, before it. Uh, the decisions communicated to Air Canada, they hang on to the information until you actually show up. Then when you show up, uh, they either allow you to get on the flight or at least to get a boarding pass. They basically make a decision about are you allowed a boarding pass or are you not allowed a boarding pass. And there's lots of stories about people who have the names of terrorists who are probably not terrorists, like this uh, four-year-old, I forget how old he is in this picture, but it's I think his third time flying. The first time he was, I think, like a baby. And uh, his name is on the no-fly list. I'm going to guess he's, he's not a terrorist, based on the fact that he's a baby. Uh, and, but he wasn't allowed to fly. They didn't find out of, until they got to the airport. Okay, It wasn't like they got told three days before with an email. Then they can start phoning people and making phone calls and not have to cancel their entire trip. Okay, They show up at the airport. The airport's like, sorry you know, you're on the no-fly list, you can't fly, and then they have to cancel everything. And, and eventually, they kind of get it sorted out. They're allowed to fly. Then, you know, next year, they do their family trip, and then all of a sudden, it's the same problem over and over again, OK? Um, so these no-fly lists are kind of notorious because they're highly secret. You can't, like, go look at the no-fly list. No one will tell you what's on the no-fly list. Uh, 
you don't even know who to contact. Like, is it a police thing? Is it like uh, national intelligence? Is it public safety? Is it border patrol? Like, who who do you even go? Like, who do you call if there's some mistaken identity? And then even the government is like uh, is has all these weird policies about the list itself. Um, so, for example, this is from a news article. Uh, so it says Canada uses to scan a vast repository of at least. 680,000 names, 40% uh, have uh, no recognized terrorist group affiliation. Anyone can add a name, not add anyone, not the public, but any law enforcement officer can add a name to the list. It's very easy, you fill out a form and now it's on the list. Okay, so they're doing some investigation, they see someone, they, they're scared that person's going to leave before they're able to question them, they'll just throw them on the no-fly list, okay? Um, but if you want to take a name off once it's on, then you have to, uh, and even if it's a typo, like maybe they mistyped it or something like that, then you have to take them to court and you have to get an order from a judge and the judge has to do it and it takes delays and there's lots of money, okay? So what happens to a list where it takes one form to add a list and it takes a two year court process that costs $100,000 to take a name off a list, okay? The list is going to get longer and longer and longer. It's never going to get shorter. That's, that's what's gonna happen. Um, and then Canada, even though they use the list, they're not allowed to, to, to even go through the court process to get the name off the list, okay? So they have to ask the US and then the US government has to go to court and, and, and try and get it off the list, okay? So these no-fly lists anyways are, are kind of, um, they tend to have a lot of false positives, we'll put it that way. So the, in this case, I guess this two scan is like a, maybe a private company, um, but the government decides to use the list or not use the, the, the list. So at the end of the day, you say the government controls the list. And then if you want to be more specific within the government, I don't know who it falls under. So in the US, I think it would fall under what's called the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, but anyways, and I think anyone can add to the list. So CIA, NSA, Border Patrol, maybe even just the FBI, like law enforcement can add names to the list. So it's sort of one of those situations where anyone can add to it, but, but yeah. But it is within the control of some department within the federal government. Okay, other questions? Okay, uh, it's seven o'clock. Why don't we take a 10 minute break and then uh, we'll continue our uh, journey through the airport. Okay, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so it, I don't have a good answer to it. it. If I had to guess, it's either they want an opportunity to have you show up at the airport. Um, so that's probably why. Uh, or it could be that they just don't want to communicate that information digitally. They would rather do it in person. Uh, or it's just not fast enough that they don't. They actually, they're finding out basically on like on the day of kind of thing. Although they could still notify you, I guess, on the day of. So th those are guesses. I don't, I don't know the answer. Yeah. Well, what is the official on the score? Uh, so I don't know that you can. I mean, it's just by a ticket. I'm just glad. Yeah, I think that the, you need some sort of confirmation. And maybe if it's a same day ticket, then the confirmation would, would entail the whole no fly list. Um, or maybe they check it when you, you hand them the boarding pass. I, anyways, the, the point is it's all secretive anyway. Um, so I think, yeah, I don't know, to, to what extent can you just show up and buy a ticket? Yeah. I know you can like rebook something that's already been booked, but, um, but anyways, yeah, it's, it's a good point. Like, I, I don't know, but anyways, this check is clearly happening because they wouldn't let you fly 
without the check happening. So yeah, it's happening. I guess in that case, it's happening in, in quick order. Or maybe they prioritize it because it's the same day. I'm not sure. Okay, so the whole goal of this was to get a boarding pass. So what's a boarding pass? Yeah, okay, so it's permission to board the plane. It's kind of like your ticket. It's actually your permission to get past security. So let's say you were on the no-fly list, but you wanted to try and board the plane anyway, then you're, they're gonna try and stop you before you even get through security. Um, and also, let's say that you're like, say I'm dropping you off at the airport, I can't walk you all the way to the gate. Usually, it, usually at security or whatever. So uh, the boarding pass like sort of, yeah, stops you there. What's on the boarding pass? Okay, so you have all the flight information. This is the flight, you have your name. You have that like little confirmation code, right? The, the password that everyone's going to protect now. Uh, then there's a couple other like things like TSA pre, what's that? Anyone know? Say it loud. So this is a US thing. So the TSA is the US agency and pre means that you can go to a different security line. So there's usually a short line and a long line and the short line are for people that have some sort of pre-clearance, nexus, global entry, some program like that, then you can have that uh, line. What's boarding group? Right, okay, yeah, so when you're going to get on the plane, they're gonna be like everyone in group one, go on the plane, everyone in group two. Generally, do you wanna be in a higher, like a sooner boarding group, or do you wanna be the last person on the plane? Why? Yeah, yeah. So usually there, there's maybe limited space in the overhead bins or whatever. And so generally, like, usually priority, like people who are flying first class, they board first. Sometimes it's like if you have a wheelchair or you have a kid with a stroller or something like that, they'll let you board for, for those kinds of reasons so you're not blocking everyone else. Uh, but then usually it's more like if you pay more, you have like a lot of loyalty points or that type of thing you get into the higher uh, boarding group. Okay, so you have your name, you have your PNR, you have your flight info, and then some other stuff. Uh, some of this data is in barcodes. Uh, some of it is human readable. Why, why, isn't all, why isn't it just a big QR code? So it could be now, I guess, because the people that look at it have the readers but in general, people want to look at this and, and know, like if you're in boarding group one, they don't want to have to scan a QR code to know it. They just want it printed on the ticket. Uh, or if you show up at the TSA pre-line, they're going to check to make sure that you should be in that line. Uh, then they want to be able to see it without scanning it. Okay, what if I, um, uh, uh, okay, so the first thing about boarding passes you should know is, is uh, who, who gives you this piece of paper? Where do you get it from? Assuming it's a piece of, does it have to be a piece of paper? Okay, so it could be a QR code that's on your phone, so that's option A. Let's assume it is a piece of paper. Where'd you get that piece of paper from? Okay, but where, who, specific, more specifically? Okay, that's when, and in, when I check in, who am I checking in with? Like, who, who's handing it to me? It, when I first lay hands on that piece of paper, where was it last? Okay, so it could be the human being that just printed it off that's giving it to me because I'm at the counter. What else could it be? Okay, okay, so two things. So it could be the kiosk, so it just printed it out. Or it could even be a website that I visited at home and then I printed it on my home computer, okay? Is there any physical security in terms of that piece of paper? So the boarding pass you get from the human, like it's on a special stock paper and it looks kind of official, right? But like a boarding pass that prints out from a kiosk is just a piece of paper and uh, the one that you print out from home is also just a piece of paper. I recently flew and I have a bunch of boarding passes I was going to 
pull them out for show and tell if I can find them. But. So most of them just are kind of garbage that look like this. OK? Now, I really want to go to the TSA pre-line. I don't have priority. What if I'm at home? I'm printing it out on my piece of paper. I'm allowed to have my boarding pass on a piece of paper. I know a little bit about Photoshop. I'm not like an expert, but I could certainly find that logo and I could drag and drop it and then hit print. What happens? OK, so it doesn't stop me from like having IDs and things like that. But my ID doesn't say whether I'm TSA pre or not. Basically, I'm going to show up and the boarding guard is going to look at it and say, oh, you're TS pre. I see the logo. You go to this line instead of this line. Maybe. Is that what happens? Or do they somehow scan the barcode and see, oh, like, it's funny, your ticket has that logo, but when I look at my barcode, it doesn't, I don't see it on my barcode. You can land to a smaller queue, but after, whenever they are scanning your QR code, you are, you are not allowed to use them. All right. How hard is it to change a QR code? Is that like some crazy QR code? No, probably if you scan it, it just has a bunch, like a, JSON or XML or something like that. Okay. All right. So let's say I want to give myself TSA pre. So I'm a little, I know a little more than Photoshop. I also know how to, I have some software that, that reads a barcode or can create a barcode for me. So I put the TSA logo on and I change the barcode. And while I'm at it, I'd like to be in boarding group one. I can get on the plane early. I know my overhead's going to fit, right? So I, I just make that change too. I throw it on. I change the QR code so it matches what's printed. Is that okay or not? No. Still, like uh, your PNR number is on the there is if they scan, they match with your PNR number. Who? Uh, the system when they scan your uh, barcode. Okay, but I'm not changing it. So I'm not changing the PNR number. Yep. Yes, there is a, like, uh, they have list of the uh, passengers. Okay, let me put the question a different way so I think I know what you're saying. Does that QR code just have the PNR number? Is it just a user friendly of the PNR? The person scans it, then there's a database, they look up that PNR, and then all the like TSA stuff is in the database. So that's option A. Okay. Option B is that. Boarding group one, 745, all that stuff is in that barcode. So that barcode, there's no database, there's no dereferencing. If all the computer databases went down, you could still scan that barcode, and it would just be a machine-readable format of everything else that's on, on the plane ticket. Okay. Now, you might not necessarily know the answer, but I'll give you a hint. Who is it that's going to scan this? All right, so it's usually the, the, the agents, the security agents. Do they work for Air Canada? No, they don't. Okay, they're they're government people. Okay, so their readers aren't hooked into Air Canada's database. Okay, they they have a TSA reader. So whatever Air and is Air Canada deciding whether I'm in boarding group one or two, or is 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 TSA deciding that? Air Canada is deciding that, right? So Air Canada has to pass the information from themselves to TSA. The way they do it was with the boarding pass. And the way they do it with the barcode is they encode that information. So the barcode is actually the encoding of all the information on the boarding pass, OK? Can, still, let me go back to the question, can I change it, though? What if I, if I go in and change the, the barcode and I change what's on the ticket, is that OK? Is there anything that would make that not OK? OK, forget about databases. There's no database. They're, they're literally only going to scan what's in that, that barcode. And it's going to show them on their little screen, basically, the information that's on the barcode. That's it. OK, that, we'll figure that out later. That's, that's the airline's problem when we board. OK, there's one thing that could stop that, and it would be cryptography. There could be a digital signature, right? So if Air Canada signed the barcode, then when, you, when I go and change it, I can change boarding group from four to one, but then it wrecks the signature. OK? So what do you think? Do you think these are digitally signed or not? 
They ought to be. They should be. Okay. I can tell you actually just by looking at that that that's not signed. Okay, I, I'm not a human computer, I can't read that barcode, but I can tell you for sure there's not a signature in that barcode. Do you know why? Signatures are big, they're not gonna fit in a barcode that size. Okay, there's, there's no way that there's a, a whole signature in that barcode, it's, it's not big enough. It would have to be like the, the whole like ticket kind of thing, okay? And, and we know actually that, that it's not, there's no message integrity on the data, okay? So you can go ahead, you can change it, you can go to websites and you tell it, you give it the boarding pass and you say, I'm flying Air Canada. And the website will say, okay, do you want TSA pre? You say, yep. What boarding group do you want? I want one. And then you press a button and then it creates a PDF with a boarding pass and you print it out and that's what you take to the airport. Okay. What if what? So it doesn't matter. I mean, QR codes are just, sort of two-dimensional things. And usually they have a mix. QR codes, you can sometimes pack a bit more data in, but a QR code for a digital signature still needs to be relatively big. Yeah. Another thing is signatures are hard to manage. Like who signs it? Like the kiosk, does it have the signature key inside that kiosk? And then it's going to sign it when it prints out the boarding pass. And then what if I hack, like is, is every Air Canada kiosk in every country have this key? If that key is in every kiosk, it just takes one person to break one kiosk and get that key, and now you can sign anyways. So we call that public key infrastructure, like, well, you've seen it before. Uh, so the management of, like, whose keys belong to who, that also would be a complete nightmare. So uh, we don't know the reason why, but they basically they don't, they don't sign anything. Yep. Yeah. yeah, so you can, so there's a security researcher, we'll see him a little later, uh, he took, actually there's a good article, so the Moodle has some, some articles about this stuff. So there's one called like, What I Brought on Board by Bruce Schneier. So Bruce Schneier is this like security guy. And uh, he took a journalist, he's like, I'm gonna teach you a bit about airport security. So one of the things they did was they printed out fake boarding passes. They gave themselves like priority boarding, they gave themselves TSA pre, and, and they went through the whole process and no one said anything. Okay. All right, what's next? So now we have our boarding pass. Okay, so we'll go drop our baggage off. Um, every bag has the name of the passenger on it and that's assumed to be, you're assumed to, 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 to be responsible for it. So if there's something found in that bag, that's your responsibility, okay? Um, now your bags don't go through with you through metal detectors and things like that. Um, so are they not checked then? Do they just go directly on the plane? Okay, so they are checked, but they're checked behind the scenes. Okay, so the um, uh, inspection can be by one of two people. So there's CA, CATSA, these are the like airline safety people. Okay, that's their job. They, they only do airlines, they don't do any other kind of transport. They only care about safety. They mainly don't want like someone to blow up an airplane. Okay, that's that's their like main objective. CBSA and law enforcement in general. CBSA is border services, so that's like only if it's crossing like from the U.S. into Canada, but also like general police and things. So let's say you have a suitcase full of drugs. Does the TSA care about that? The answer is no. They don't really like. They're they're certainly not going to turn a blind eye to it. They'll report it. But that's not their job. Their job is to make sure you don't have a bomb so you don't blow up the airplane, okay? Uh, if you're smuggling a bunch of drugs across the border, that's uh, CBSA's concern, okay? So you have two different government agencies. They're working, they have slightly different objectives. Uh, so both of them will be looking at your, do at your bags. Uh, they'll go through x-rays. They might have dogs that, that smell things. They will open your bags up. They'll go through them. They're allowed to look through them. Uh, what if you lock your bag? Okay, they'll break open the lock. Yeah, the TSA lock, so if it's a TSA lock, then they have a key, they can open it. Okay, what's a TSA lock? A TSA approved lock. Okay, so there's a, a special lock you can buy. It's called TSA approved. You put it on your luggage, and there's two keys that open it. There's a key that comes with the lock. You're the only one that has that key. 
And then there's another key that TSA can use to unlock it. Okay. What's that other key? Okay, it's called a master key. So what in give me a one sentence, what's a master key? Okay, so one key can open every locks. All right. And there's one master key, right? Why multiple master keys? Okay, okay. So every there's TSA agents all over the world. Uh, they're in, well, at least over the U.S., the TSA specifically U.S., but every airport, and there's multiple people working there. Um, so there's going to be a bunch of keys of these floating around, okay? Um, how many keys does it take to leak in order for all of us to have a TSA master key if we want it? Takes one. One TSA agent that has one of these keys once. You don't even need to get the key off them. If you can take a picture of it, you can 3D print it. Do you think you can get a 3D, uh, like a, a blueprint for the TSA master key if you wanted? Do you think you could buy one off of eBay? Okay, the answer is yes. Um, so there's special TSA locks. They have two keys, one for the user, one for TSA. It's a master key. There's about 50,000 people walking around with these every day. And so one of them leaks it, it's useless. And I think it took, I don't know, I, I think before they even implemented the policy, it had already leaked. All right. And so anyway, so you can you can pre 3D print your own if you want one at home. You can buy one off of eBay, uh, whatever you want. Uh, in general, this is this has nothing to do with with airline security. It's just another quote from an uh, uh, article that I found interesting. But it's the same principle. Um, if you have one master key, it just takes one bad person, right? And if you're if this is a key that need, you need 50,000 people to, to use this to do their job, right? It's, it's eventually going to leak. And we see this same story over and over again. We saw it with DVDs. They're like, oh, DVDs are going to be encrypted, right? The problem is that every DVD is encrypted with the same key. So it just takes one person to get that key and all your, all your devices have that key in it. If it can read the DVD, you may not even know what a DVD is, but anyways, it's like the movie that's on a disc. Um, but anyways, you get one of those, you hack one DVD player, the key's somewhere in there, otherwise it couldn't play the movie. Or you get software, you reverse engineer it, that key has to go into RAM at some point. Okay, that key leaks and then now all that encryption is dead, right? So anyway, this happens again. This was an article where they're like, uh, they hand out security clearances. But now there's like 1.25 million people in the US that have a security clearance. So is that really a security clearance at that point? It just takes one, you know, Edward Snowden type of person to leak all the information that has a security clearance, right? So it's not really, doesn't really mean much. Okay. Um, the other thing about airports uh, baggage is that usually it's physically isolated from the passengers. So let's say you have something in the bag and mid-flight you want to go and get your bag. It won't, like, there's not even a door from the plane to where the baggage is. Uh, it might not even be pressurized. Um, so anyway, so it's in some, like, physically isolated uh, compartment. Then they'll cut your lock, and you'll get it back without, with, a, with no lock. And usually they're supposed to put a note on it saying that they looked at it. So there might be a tag. Even with the TSA key, they'll, they'll relock it for you. And so usually you have the lock because you're trying to keep other passengers from going through your bag. So that's why you have the TSA lock so that, uh, that when they're done with it, they'll relock it. And then if someone else pulls your bag off, they can't go through it or add stuff to your bag. Uh, but now because anyone can have a TSA master key, they can just open the lock and do whatever they want to do. Okay, so we dropped our bags off. Now where? Okay, so now we go to the security line. Uh, before we get to the actual metal detectors and all of that stuff, there's usually one small thing that happens first. At the start of the line, what is it? Okay, so they ask for your barcode, they, or sorry, your boarding pass, they scan it. Why? Okay, so they might direct you, make sure you're at the right terminal like that. So it could be a basic sanity check. Um, what else? Okay, so you can't share a boarding pass. Uh, do they check your passport? 
So this is a difference. So in Canada, they don't. You just go in line. You don't do a passport check. In the U.S., they do. Um, so yeah. And uh, other things are you're not allowed to go through security unless if you actually have a flight, you paid for it. So the boarding pass prevents that. Uh, and uh, some of it's just like logistical as well, um, where they want to timestamp when you went into the security line. Then if there's delays or the line's really long, then they can try and figure out, okay, did this person even show up or are they stuck in the line? Can we find them? Or if there's some dispute later and you're like, I missed my flight because the line was too long, then they have this information. Now, the other thing that you may or may not know, this happens in the US anyways, we don't know to what extent it's uh, implemented because it's top secret, but then there was some leaks, took one person with the security clearance to leak it to the press, is these people are also trained in psychology. So they're looking for certain suspicious behaviors uh, and if they see them, then it might result in you either going through secondary screening, uh, which means they'll pull you aside, or they might even refer you directly to the police. Uh, so this program is called SPOT. Uh, you can uh, actually read the document itself. It's also on Moodle. And so this is a, uh, it's a sort of score-based type of thing. So what they do is they look at you and they try and decide if you meet any of these criteria. If they do, they give you points. So for example, if you arrive for, you're late for your flight, they're going to give you a point. Uh, if you're like kind of flushed, they'll give you a point. If you smell bad, you have a strong body odor, they'll give you a point. Uh, if you're holding your bag too tightly, they'll give you two points. Uh, if you're like yawning or like kind of, I don't know, grooming with your hair, excessive crying or laughter or chatter, they'll give you two points. Uh, if you look like you have a disguise on, they'll give you three points. Uh, if you are looking confused, they'll give you three points. If you start asking about security processes and procedures, uh, they'll give you three points. If it looks like you're singling secretly to someone else, uh, they'll give you three points. And then uh, if you are traveling with a family, they'll take two points off. Uh, if you're traveling with a spouse, they'll take two points off if you look older than 55 years old. And in general, if you're at least 55 for a woman or female presenting, or if you're over 65 for a male, uh, then they'll, they'll take off one point. And then uh, if you get three points, you're okay. So you can do a couple of these things. But if you do too many, four to five, then you go to secondary screening. And if you do six or more, then not only do they take you to secondary screening, they also notify law enforcement officer, LEO, which means they, they get the police. Okay. Then there's um, other like point systems for other kinds of things. So this is like your behavior. This is items that you might be carrying. So if you have GPS units, scuba gear, military gear, a whole bunch of prepaid cards, rope, duct tape, loose batteries, uh, these are things that could get you in trouble. And then there's signs of deception. So if you, uh, if you cover your mouth when you speak, uh, if you don't remember significant facts, uh, if you're yawning a lot, uh, if you're trying to like not answer the question, if you're clearing your throat, if you're blinking too fast, if your face is too flushed, uh, all of these things uh, can, can get you referred to law enforcement as well. And then there's, these are like the, the super bad things that will automatically get you uh, reported. So if you have at least six points from the previous sections, uh, and then there's uh, suicide bomber, indi indicative behaviors, disorderly passenger, uh, displays two or more signs of deception. If you have a firearm, if you have a lot, lot, lot of money, uh, if you refuse to screen, uh, if you have a prohibited item that's not a weapon and you're concealing it, uh, anyways, you can go through it. Okay, so this is, uh, this is a program that TSA implemented. Uh, they ran it, uh, it leaked to the press. No one knows whether they still do it or not, but these officers, at least at the time, were trained 
uh, for this behavioral kinds of stuff. Do you think this kind of thing works? What are they trying to do with this? What are they trying to stop? Terrorism, basically, someone blowing up a plane. Do you think it works? Do you think they, they'll, uh, they'll stop terrorists with this program? OK, well, let's, we actually have some data on it. Uh, actually, first, there's a psychologist who says what she thinks about it. She says that humans barely do better than a 50-50 guess uh, in trying to dis decide whether someone's being deceptive or not. Uh, basically, you can train a TSA agent for hours and hours and hours, and they won't be any better than someone who has zero training. Um, and so, yeah, suppose experts like cops or custom agents are no better than anyone else. There's a few, if any, reliable cues to deception, so deception looks different. And uh, if you're stressed or you're nervous or you're uncomfortable, which you might be because you're flying and maybe you didn't sleep a lot and maybe you're about to miss your flight, you know, there's a lot of reasons why people might be stressful, then that doesn't mean that you're like hiding things or, or being deceptive or are a terrorist. And then we can look at the actual data. So this, by the way, it costs $900 million to train all these TSA agents and come up with the program. And so uh, there was one, uh, there's one set of data. So they ran it for five weeks. 4% of people got enough points to, to uh, get referred to secondary screening. And 0.4% uh, of the 4%, so 47 uh, people, uh, were actually referred to law enforcement. Okay, uh, Of the 47 that were referred to law enforcement, most of them were left let go, but 16 were actually arrested. And so 16 represents 0.01% of all the people that went through the airport over those five weeks. Uh, 14 were arrested because of immigration reasons, so they didn't have proper documentation, uh, they didn't have a visa. One was arrested because they were drunk, one was arrested because they had drugs on them, and zero were arrested because they were a terrorist. Okay? So basically it didn't work, it didn't catch terrorism, but most people looked at this and said, actually, you know, this is why they're doing it. They actually, it's targeted at immigrants and they're trying to, to stop illegal immigration. And they're, they're doing all this under the theater of security and protecting people from terrorists, but this is the real reason that they're doing it. Anyways, that's a political opinion that some people have. I don't, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. But the data also depends, because if there was, in reality, 20 that should have been arrested, is that the direction? Yeah, exactly, yeah. If there, there was even one terrorist here, then you might say, oh, it was worth it was worth $900 million. So it's all like give or take. But most people, based on the science underneath it, thought it was just, it was dumb to do in the first place. OK, uh, what's next? Oh, the other thing, too, is like these people got program They got caught when this thing was running. But it also doesn't necessarily mean that they wouldn't have. Like if you're there and you're intoxicated, even if they didn't have all this training and things like that, they might have still pulled you aside as well. So, OK, uh, so we made it through the first person. Now we go through actual security itself. OK, so this is a search of you and your items. I'm going to switch to the Canadian context. So in Canada, it's called the CATSA. In the US, it's called TSA. Uh, Again, they usually ask for your boarding pass. Again, it's mostly logistical. They know now that you reach security, they want to make sure that you actually have a boarding pass. They don't check your passport generally. Okay, in Canada, uh, for sure they don't. Um, what, then they're going to scan you and your items. How do they scan you or, and your items? Okay, so there's a physical search. Do you always get physically searched? Uh, metal detectors. Okay, there's metal detectors. Okay, so there's a like a an X-ray style scanner. That's the one where you stand up and the thing like whirls around. Uh, so it's slightly different technology. Uh, so that's three or four. Pat down, uh, X-ray, uh, metal detector. Okay, so the, that's slightly separate, but yeah, yeah. So there's all this stuff you have to take out of your bag and things like that. We'll get to that in a sec. But what else do they use to actually scan you or your items or? Try and find things. Sometimes they use dogs. So I've been in airports where they just have dogs and they walk around. And they actually then let you go through security. They're like, well, the dog said nothing. So um, Sometimes they have these chemical swabs. 
So they make you show your wrists or they swab your coat or your bag. And it's like a little disc that's on a stick. And then they put it in a machine and then the machine tells them whether it's good or bad. What are they looking for? Okay, so it's, it's chemicals. It's not cocaine or drugs. Usually they, again, TSA, that's not their job. Okay, yeah, it's bomb, like explosive material. Okay, so if you made a bomb, uh, you'll get some residue on you and that's what they're trying to find. Or if you had a bomb in your bag at some point, even if it's not there now, uh, there might be some residue. What about infection? About which? Disease. Sorry, the... Disease or infection? Uh, yeah, so like, you mean do they care about it or? I mean, you mean the swabs. Oh, the swabs, yeah, no, no. As far as I know, they're not, uh, yeah, for that. So again, not everyone knows everything, but as far as, I'm cons as far as I know, they're strictly chemicals, strictly explosives, and that's it. Um, okay, so metal detectors look like that, that uh, the, the nudie scans, as they used to be called, because they create a nude picture of you. Uh, and for privacy reasons, the person looking at the monitor has to be in a separate room so they can't see both you and your nude body uh, on the monitor at the same time. There's a physical pat down. Uh, there's physical inspection so they can open your bag and go through it and look at it. Uh, they might use dogs, and then this is the sort of chemical s swab thing that I was talking about. These are the lists, official lists from Transport Canada of, of what you're not allowed to take on. So guns, fire alarm, firearms, uh, things that could stun someone, something that's sharp, uh, just in general tools that could, could threaten the safety of the aircraft, uh, blunt objects that could cause serious injury, so like a bat or something like that. <coughs> anything that's explosive, any liquids, uh, so we all know this, aerosols and gels count as liquids. What's the rule? So the rule is 100 ml or less by volume, if it's by weight it's 100 grams. And does that mean you can bring 100, 100 millimeter bottles on board? So there's a, also a max size for like the total amount. So they usually give you a Ziploc bag and all has to fit in the Ziploc bag. Um, acids, compressed gases, like that kind of stuff isn't allowed. And any kind of like, like on the disease end, like mold, like, like that kind of stuff um, isn't, isn't allowed either. Or actually, I guess there's a weight limit on it. So you're allowed to some extent, but not totally. Okay, uh, the liquid thing. So does that mean you literally can't? Yeah. Yeah, so it's still considered... Uh, they would consider it a liquid, I think. It's, it's a loophole, but yeah. I, I, so how would it show up on an x-ray? I don't, I don't know. They won't. I'm sure they won't. But why, why do they not allow liquids? So that's, uh, that's a great question. So why don't they allow liquids? Okay. So theoretically, it could be allowed, but I haven't tried it yet. I see. So that you're the first person that ever mentioned that. So I'll look into it and see, and I'll update the slides. But, um, but the reason they don't allow liquids, it, they don't really care about alcohol so much. Um, I mean, people care in general about it, but it's, it's like liquid explosives and, and things like that. And so a liquid bomb is pretty potent, and so that's why they, they limit it. Um, now, there are new rules where... Actually, no, you, you, I think the limit's still in place, but you just don't have to take it out of your bag or something like that. But I was reading an article just yesterday about these new machines that the UK is supposed to have, but they're delayed. Um, okay, can you ever take more than a bottle with more than 100 ml on it, in it? Is there any exceptions to the rule? Okay, so I've traveled with kids myself. So if you have breast milk, if you have formula, you are actually allowed to bring as much as you want. Could you make a bomb and put it in uh, like baby formula, a baby bottle and make it look milky? Yeah. Sure, you could, right? Uh, anyone know any other exceptions? There's one other big exception. Medical? So yeah, so medical in general, and then there's one specific kind of thing that tends to come in a big bottle, but you don't need a prescription or anything for it. 
Um, so I'll, I'll just show you. So it's, uh, breast milk, juice, or food for infants, that's allowed. And the other one, for some reason, is contact lens cleaner fluid. I think because the, you traditionally could only buy it in a big bottle, okay? And so for whatever reason, you were allowed to bring a big bottle, like a one liter bottle of contact lens fluid. Could you put a liquid explosive in a contact lens fluid bottle? Absolutely. Um, so this was the article I mentioned earlier. So he like, they modified their boarding pass that, that's in the article. The other fun thing he did was he, uh, it says Schneier carried two bottles labeled saline solution, 24 ounces in total. So what is that in, in liters? It's I think two liters or something like that. So a lot, like way, way over the limit through security. Uh, an officer asked him why he needed two bottles. Why not just one? Uh, if, you're, if you're doing uh, contact lens fluid, why do you need two of them? He said, well, I have two eyes. <laughs> and then they let him through anyways. And so, anyways, so his point is that this is all theater. If, if you're really a terrorist, you can get liquids through, and it's all just kind of nonsense that, that uh, makes people feel better and safer about, about flying. Uh, other things, they, they ask about laptops, why? You could put a bomb in a laptop. On an x-ray, a laptop kind of looks like at least the circuitry of a bomb. So usually they make you put it out separately. They might ask you to turn it on. That's their basic check of whether it's a bomb or not. Could you have a laptop that you actually open up when you press the power button, it boots up, but like 95% of it's a bomb and there's just like a little Arduino chip in the corner, yes. right? That's enough to boot up an operating system, absolutely, right? Uh, shoes, why do we take our shoes off? Someone put a bomb in a shoe. Okay, they were trying to light it on the plane. The person sitting beside them said, that's really weird, why are you trying to light your shoe on fire? They tackled them, and so they were able to get the bomb before it exploded. And then the next day, everyone had to take their shoes off. And still, in the US, not in Canada, uh, just a couple months ago, I flew in the US and I had to take my shoes off. Okay, uh, that's the actual shoe and what it looked like. And Bruce Steyer here is saying, we defend against what the terrorists did last week. All right, so that's security. I'm going a little faster now because I want to get through this before the class is over. Uh, what's after security? Okay, we're ready to board. Do we have to do anything else before we sit down on the plane seat? Any other ID checks or anything like that? Okay. Okay, what do you show? So you show your boarding pass, anything else? And your passport. And your passport. Is it possible that you got all the way to that desk without showing your passport to anyone? Mm -hmm. It is in Canada, okay? Like, let's go through it. I checked in on my phone, okay? I got a boarding pass on a QR code. No one checked my passport. I went to the security line. I gave my boarding pass. They didn't check my passport. I went to the, the person at the security gate or sorry, at the actual metal detector, they wanted to check my boarding pass, I didn't show my passport. Now I'm through the gate, through the security, I'm at the gate, I'm about to get on the plane, and for the first time in, in the whole process, someone's looking at my ID. Okay, keep that in mind. Um, oh, by the way, uh, there's actually another step that's optional, and sometimes it, it can happen at different stages, but uh, just to get it out of the way, um, in Canada, if I'm flying to, to the US, once I go through security, then I actually go through US Customs. So I do that in Montreal. And then when I get on the plane, I fly to the US, I get off the plane, I don't have to go through Customs, okay? M most other countries, you'll fly, and then you'll get off the plane, and then you have to go through Customs, okay? So, and if you're flying domestically, I'm flying to Toronto, then there's no Customs, period, okay? So Customs is a sort of optional step. But there's a lot of security, obviously, involved in Customs as well. Um, so customs will absolutely check your ID, okay? They might not look at your boarding pass, but they're going to check your ID, you ha your passport. Uh, I'm assuming you're flying internationally, otherwise there would be no customs. So it has to explicitly be a passport. You have to have your visa information. Uh, you, they might ask about your flight details, so you should have that handy as well. Um, they don't really care about whether you're going to blow up the plane or not. They care about if you're a terrorist and you're going to come into the country. Okay, but their job is slightly different than TSA. Uh, they do care a lot about what are you bringing across the border? Are you bringing a lot of cash? Are you bringing merchandise that you haven't declared? Uh, are you bringing 
drugs, other controlled substances, are you bringing weapons, uh, even food items. So like, say you go to a country, there's, why, why do they care about food? I fly somewhere, I fly to Europe and I'm bringing home some cheese. Okay, so there could be contaminations, there could be like pests or things like that that are in another country that aren't in the country that you're flying to and so they wanna control all of that stuff. Um, uh, if you are declaring, okay, the other thing too is that, that there's stuff you can't fly with and there's stuff you can fly with, you just have to declare it and then there's stuff you can fly with but you don't have to declare it, okay? So if you have a bunch of t-shirts, you don't have to tell anyone you have a bunch of t-shirts, okay? If you have alcohol, you have to say it, okay? But it doesn't mean it's not necessarily allowed. They might just say, well, you have to pay a tax on that, okay? Or I have a lot of money, it's more than $10,000, I'm gonna declare it, okay? Doesn't mean I can't necessarily go across the border with it, they're just gonna ask me some questions about it. And then there's stuff like you just can't go across the border with a gun, it doesn't matter if you declare it or not. Um, uh, they have the option of denying you entry to the country. They also have the option of detaining you uh, they can detain you without charging you with anything. Uh, the detention is pretty, like, like basically you don't have necessarily the right to a lawyer. You don't have the right to call anyone. There's no, like, bounds on how long they're allowed to detain you. So what can happen to you going across a border is a lot more severe than what, say, a police officer could do if they arrested you or, or took you into custody or detained you. Um, so basically all your rights get suspended uh, when you go across the border. They can look at your phone. If you have a password on the phone, they can demand that you unlock it. If you have a password on your computer, they can ask for it. They will go through your phone. Um, and uh, you can like refuse to answer questions, that's fine. But then eventually they'll, they'll, they might, you know, they, they'll probably deny you entry. And then there's also like, we'll pretend you never came into our country, but you need to leave or there's like, we're officially denying you entry and you can't come back for another year, or you may, may, may never be allowed back into the country ever, okay? So there's different levels of, of penalties. Um, there's a good show called, uh, like a reality show that is like these custom officers. It follows them around, it's in Canada, it's called Border Security. And it's kind of a fun show like to see what they do. And a lot of it's like just, like people trying to bring food and things like that across, but, when they get the inclination, uh, a lot of it has to do with like, if you're coming here to work and you don't have a visa, right? So if they get the inclination that you're working, they will turn your life inside out to find out the truth, right? So what they'll do is like, there's lots of examples of it where um, someone will be like, oh, I'm just coming here to visit family. They're like, okay, well, who's, who's your family? Oh, I, actually, I don't really have family. There's just some guy I know. Well, how do you know them? Well, I, I talk to him online. Are, are you going to work for him? No, 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 I'm not going to work. I'm just, you know, I'm just going to visit and then I'm going to go back. And they're like, okay, give me your phone. Then they go through, they find that guy and they call him from your phone. And they're like, I have this guy. He's, you know, he's here at detention. I'm detaining him. Uh, what, what's your understanding of why he's coming? And they're like, oh yeah, I hired him to like come pick apples for like two weeks or whatever, right? That, that's the kind of thing that they'll do. Like they'll go through everything. They'll call people. They'll, they'll, they'll figure it all out. Um, and then, and you can see it happen on the, on the reality show. Okay. So customs is like, it's very serious business. Okay. Then we can actually board the flight. Uh, so you finally show your ID, you show your boarding pass, Air Canada, you're showing to Air Canada. So this isn't a security people. Okay. They have a database. They're going to check that you're on the flight. Your seats are assigned correctly. Um, all of that kind of stuff. And then they'll, they could deny you uh, uh, boarding at that point, but generally if you made it this far, you're probably gonna get on the plane, unless if you're late or they gave your seats away or something like that. Uh, so this could be the only time your ID and boarding pass are checked together. Uh, you need a passport if you're flying internationally, if you're flying domestically, it's just a photo ID. And um, for a long time in the US, if you're flying domestically, they wouldn't check your ID at this point. They had an ID check earlier in their process, like with TSA, they check your ID, uh, but, they, uh, but they didn't check your ID at the gate. Um, there was someone that found a loophole in this policy. Uh, so they said, well, when you check in, they check your boarding pass against a no-fly list. 
And then when you uh, go to sec screening in the US, they would check your boarding pass against your passport or your ID. Uh, so the, the TSA person would look at that. And then what should happen is that when you board the flight, Air Canada should check everything. So they, they're checking your boarding pass, they're checking your ID, and the government has reported back to them whether you're allowed to fly or not. So they, they also have that information as well. Okay. Um, but in the US, uh, they, weren't, uh, they weren't doing this last check. Okay. So basically the picture looked like this. This was the only thing that's being checked. Is there a policy loophole if, if, if uh, TSA checks that you're not on the no-fly list? Sorry, if the, if the Air Canada checks that you're not on the no-fly list and you have the right boarding pass, and if uh, TSA checks that your passport matches your boarding pass, is there a problem? How? Uh, so get, get someone else's ID. But then they can ID yourself. Okay, it's a good guess. Using a different boarding pass for the no fly list and your boarding pass for the ID check. Okay, exactly. So what if you have two boarding passes? Okay, you, uh, you're the terrorist, okay? And so you have a fake boarding pass uh, that matches your actual ID. And then you have a boarding pass that you actually booked uh, using someone else's ID who's not on the no-fly list. Okay? So when you go to the airline, you show them boarding pass one, and they say, is this person on the no-fly list or not? And the answer is no, they're not. Then you go to security, and security says, okay, I need your passport and boarding pass. Uh, your passport, we're gonna assume you can't fake your passport. So you show them your real passport, then you need a boarding pass that doesn't exist, right? Like a passenger that's not actually on that flight, but with the same name that matches your passport. But because this is TSA and not the airline, they don't know who's flying on the flights. That's, that's Air Canada's database. Their database is just, uh, basically they're just checking that the passport and the boarding pass match, okay? Uh, so then they let you through uh, and then you can get onto a flight. So there was, anyways, there was a paper that, that uh, proposed this. Uh, this person also made a website that lets you fake all the data on your boarding pass and print out a fake boarding pass. Uh, and because we said there's no signatures on boarding passes, you can also get away with uh, changing the name on the boarding pass. And this person got their door kicked down by the FBI uh, because they did all this. And ultimately, there were no charges that were laid against them, but it was, uh, they might have regretted doing it. I don't know. Uh, oh, yeah, this is just the news article. So the FBI raids boarding, boarding pass maker's house, seizes computers, uh, and then eventually they got rid of the rule and they changed the policy. They realized, though, this person's right. Uh, there is this loophole, and so now they check ID at the gate as a direct response to this. Okay, so what are some lessons that we can learn from this whole airport security policies about policies in general? Okay, so one of the things that made this difficult, especially in that last example, is you have different organizations that have different access to different data and they have different goals. Some people are looking for drugs, some people are making sure that nobody's on the no-fly list, some people are making sure people are sitting in the right seats, uh, some people are worried about people bringing cheese across the border, okay? And so somehow, all of these people have to work together. You have to have a policy that's that across all of these five different organizations results in the net like product that you want, which is like no terrorists are going to fly on an airplane or, or whatever your, your overall goals are. Okay? So when you have multiple organizations, they all have their own policies, they don't share information, then it gets really hard to guarantee that certain properties are held all the way across. Another thing, this is a quote from the paper, they say, Technological sophistication and research novelty are negatively correlated with security impacts on users, uh, meaning that researchers like to study things that are really technical and, you know, I'm going to study kernels and how you can write exploits for kernels. That's like good academic research. Uh, it's very technical. I'll get lots of journal articles because it looks very technical. 
Uh, but what is the real impact on users, right? Uh, but policies, no one studies policies because it's just, you know, people decide to do this instead of that. It's all like kind of fluffy. But these policy decisions are the things that really have impact on users. Okay, what can we do about this? Okay, so now it's, let's think about methodology. I said there's no good methodologies. So we could hire someone to go through our policies and try and figure out if there's loopholes in them. Okay, so these are called external audits. That's fine. Uh, you can get jobs doing that. Uh, that's fine. Um, they're expensive. You might spend hundreds of hours auditing. Uh, you uh, need ethics clearance uh, in order to do it yourself. So um, what I was going to say is that these researchers decided to do that. So when they called up and tried to do the SIM swapping on 40 different, uh, whatever the number was, 40 different uh, telecoms, uh, they had to get ethics clearance from their university even to just call them because they're talking to another human. They spent hundreds of hours making all of these phone calls. Um, the other problem with this is that if they find a flaw in one company's policy, it doesn't necessarily translate into any other com company. So every company has to sort of start from scratch and, and redo it. Um, another thing you could do is you could say, we have all these like websites where you can report uh, vulnerabilities uh, in software. We'll even pay you. If you give us a, a vulnerability, we'll assess it. And if it's real, we'll give you a bounty for finding it. You could do the same thing with policies. Right? If someone can find a flaw in this policy, we're going to pay you $100,000 and, and we'll get notified of it and we'll fix it. But no one does that, as far as I know. Um, you could try and use laws and regulations. So the government could step in and say, you have to do, do it this way. Okay? Uh, eventually, the FCC stepped in and said, uh, SIM swapping needs clear guidelines and this is, this is how you do it. Or maybe it's pending, I forget. Uh, they're trying to do it. I don't know if they did it or they're trying to do it, but uh, they're, they're trying to put laws around that. Uh, you could just wait for people to find it and then report it and make a big news story about it, like all the news articles that we've seen throughout this lecture. Another more technical thing you could think about is, could I turn a policy into a set of logical statements? And then I could have ask a computer to like figure out, like I could say, okay, these, these are the, all the checks that happen. Is there any way that someone that's not on the no-fly list could end up on a flight? Is that a reachable condition? And there's these like SAT solvers that can solve really complicated, uh, hard problems that are computationally hard. Uh, they use some heuristics, so even if the worst case, if the worst case complexity is something like MP hard, uh, they can still usually solve it anyways because you usually don't have the exact worst case. Um, the problem with this is a, a couple. There's a couple issues. One is if you miss something when you model it, then there could still be a flaw there. Uh, the second thing is you are doing it specific for one company and one policy. It's not going to translate to other companies and policy. So it's a lot of work on just one thing. Um, uh, yeah, so, so if policies are harder than co code. Like we have software vulnerability. Like we can do static analysis, dynamic analysis. We can do a lot of things with code. So why can't we just turn policies into code and, and do the same types of things? Um, so the model might miss something. Uh, it's expensive and you can't reuse it. And I guess that was it. I thought that there might be a third one, but there isn't. Okay, so that's all I had to say. Any questions? Yeah, so the, the answer, like Bruce Schneier would tell you, it's kind of theater. It's trying to make people calm and they feel like because the, the security is so tight, it's safe to fly. And it's generally good for the economy to have people flying around. And we don't want people worried that their plane's going to blow up when they fly. And so that's, that's basically that's the whole operation. And at the same time, we might catch some people that are trying to, to immigrate illegally. Yeah? True. Agree. Agree. And so he would say the same thing. Yeah. So that, that's the one thesis. Another thesis is we, it's, a, it's a big vulnerability. Terrorists are trying to blow up airplanes, and so we have to do something about it. 
And then from there, you can branch to like, what we're doing is really good. Like by limiting liquids and checking people's shoes, that's like really solving the problem. And then there's the people that think that that is, like, like Bruce Schneier said, you're, you're, trying to, um, uh, you're trying to stop what the terrorists did last week. So they're going to come up with some new way of doing it uh, that you aren't checking for that's going to get through, through checks. And so either you, you, you don't spend so much money on it and you just kind of let things happen, or you try and be more sensible and, and try and find other approaches that work. But then people are usually a little short on like what are the approaches that would work that, that are way less expensive. But it's kind of crazy that you can take a train or a bus. I can take a train to Toronto or a bus to Toronto. I don't, there's zero security, but I hop on an airplane. Yeah. Uh, what kind of question we expect from today's lecture next time? Uh, all the questions. <laughs> so the whole, the whole thing will be on, uh, on, on airport security. Um, I don't know, is, is there no questions about it in the sample exam? I want to give you a question that I'm not actually going to ask. So that's why I'm, and I won't ask you anything that's on the sample exam. So if there's anything on the sample exam. I started, I don't know if I always taught airport security yet. I think it might be a newer addition to this. But. <coughs> oh, here you go. Maori exploits a loophole in airport security procedures to board a flight despite being on the no-fly list. What is that under stride? Is that spoofing? Is it tampering? Is it repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, or escalation of privilege? Okay, so that's the question you can ask, expect on the exam. Yeah. Last question. Can actually be spoofing? Yeah, so these questions, I, uh, I, I actually will, like, all joking aside, I probably will ask you some stride questions. I'll, I'll get you at some point to, to categorize things uh, because of stride. But I've learned through blood, sweat, and tears of asking these exam questions and people saying, you know what, that, that could be spoofing or that could be both tampering and this, that now the questions, this, this, these questions are five years old. I've learned a lot about it. And so now I, I pay a lot of attention to making sure they fit one and only one category. Yeah. But these questions maybe are, are like before I put so much effort into that. So anyways, you learned something. You know, you know at least one thing to expect on the exam. How many questions? I, I don't know. Uh, usually, um, the formula I've used in the past would be like kind of like two short answers to four short answers, and then maybe like 30 multiple choice. Yeah, so the multiple choice would be worth one mark each. The short answer might be worth two, three, four marks. Uh, and so the, um, anyways, it's about like you have, uh, four minutes per point on the exam or something like that. So every multiple choice you would have at least, or should it be more than that? It's a three hour exam, so you would have six minutes per multiple choice without the short answer, but then the short answer will lead up some time too. So anyways, the point is like you, you'll have lots of time to sit. And, and the ones, some of them you're gonna know right away, and those ones you can um, uh, answer quickly. But yeah, in general, I don't have problems where, there might be people who stay till the end of the exam, but they're usually like like trying to think about things or, like, it's not like they're rushing and writing up to the last minute and then I'm pulling the exam away while they're trying to write things out. Never, never, ever happens. Like, by, by the end of an hour or two, most people are just like sort of like looking around, thinking about things and that type of stuff. And people start handing stuff in after an hour. 
or even less. I've had people like finish it in 45 minutes. So uh, in general, unless if I decide to, to, to punish you with lots of extra questions, uh, in general, my exams, they're not, um, they're not long. So that's one tactic that some professors use is like just give more questions than you could possibly answer and then the good students will answer more than the bad students and then that's how the grade sorting happens. So that's not the approach I use. That's just my memory of, of myself being a, a grad student. Other questions? Yeah, uh, let me. Is it here or no? Yeah, okay. The, the impersonal one? Okay, all I meant is if I have your PNR and I want to cancel your flight, I don't have to, it's not like I have to go up to the airline person and security cameras are catching me and I'm like, I'm you and I'm gonna cancel it. I can just do it from a website. So I just type in your last name, I type in your number, and then the website's like, hey, you wanna cancel the flight? And I say yes. That's all I meant by that, yeah. So it's, it's an easy attack for someone to do and they're not gonna leave a lot of fingerprints on doing that attack. Like no one will necessarily know that they did it. You can go over tour if, you, if you're really concerned about it. And basically you're, no, you're never gonna get caught doing this. Okay, uh, I'll see you all next week. So next Friday and then the following Tuesday.